So my next question um, has to do with specialty care. Um, so what are the challenges um, that you see in referring patients to specialists or accessing the necessary diagnostic tests or technologies um, for patients with type two diabetes? And how do social determinants of health impact these challenges? So I'll start on the receiving end because I'm a specialist. And so I see a lot of patients coming from primary care with very poorly controlled diabetes, uh, multiple comorbidities, as we discussed, who are coming to me as a cardiologist to get uh, assessed for chest pain or get assessed for shortness of breath. And depending on their level of insurance coverage, cost is, is a huge barrier to not just, you know, making a diagnosis. In other words, they don't want to pay for the stress test. They don't want to pay for the coronary CT angiogram. They, they can't but also the treatment. Once I do diagnose some problem and I say, now you need you know, GLP-1 receptor agonist and an SGLT2 inhibitor because you've got kidney disease and heart disease and chronic heart failure that's with diastolic dysfunction, they can't. And so I think the fact that we have these expensive diagnostic tests, we have these expensive medications, it really offers patients who are with limited resources very few options to not just get treated, but to manage. And so a lot of times what I see end up happening is that they don't come because they don't think that they're gonna be able to pay for the specialist care, all the things that specialist care lead to, which are expensive medications. The other, of course, is the barrier of getting to the specialist, taking time off of work, you know, to, access if you're living in an area where there aren't a lot of specialists readily available, getting to them and getting to them quickly is obviously a barrier as well. So I, I think it ties my hands, it ties the patient's hands. And when you have a patient who has competing social determinants of health without addressing those, and I call social determinants of health actually the weakest link in medicine, because we're so busy thinking about the science and writing prescriptions for expensive things that if the patient doesn't ever fill that prescription and take that medication, you haven't made any kind of an impact on the disease. So without thinking about how to incorporate these into the care of our patients in a systematic fashion, so that it's not all on the patient to figure out how to pay $700 a month for their Eliquis or for their Zep bound or whatever, but we are actually taking responsibility as a system as well. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Rosas, you're also a specialist. So how do you, tell me how, um, what your experience is as a nephrologist. Um, so, you know, I work in a diabetes center, so I have the privilege when they come here, they already have the diagnosis by a fantastic group of uh, primary care providers. Um, but I think that we have a, a limitation there. I think that's the first limitation. A, a lot of social determinants of health also, also impact who gets diagnosed and who gets that screening test. And without that screening test, that's like the very first step uh, to um, getting to know that you have diabetes. And in kidney disease, which is obviously my area, uh, the two screening tests are urine albumin to creatinine ratio and the blood test, which is creatinine to measure people's estimated GFR. And we see there the first barrier because even individuals with insurance only not even half of them get an annual urine albumin to creatinine ratio. And we know that half the people with a chronic kidney disease only have elevated uh, albumins in the urine and they have normal GFRs. Those individuals are still at very high risk of cardiovascular disease, of mortality, of kidney failure, et cetera. And we're not diagnosing those patients. And that's why I am very, um, I, I, I'm very, I think it's very important to a screen patients because once that diagnosis is in the chart, you write type two diabetes or chronic kidney disease, the other providers are aware and those patients are more likely to be on ACE inhibitors. They're more likely to be prescribed the, the guideline directed therapy uh, that Dr. Coley was mentioning. So I think the very the very first thing that we need to do is, is really uh, raise awareness of the screening test and really screen everybody. And we know that individuals with lower socioeconomic status or higher risk for uh, the social determinants of health, they're the ones that are less likely to be screened. Mm -hmm. I mean, you made such a good point because like, I love the calcium score as a test, as a cardiologist, it's a screening test, it's a primary prevention test. You get ahead of the plaque, you don't wait for the heart attack, you find out if they have atherosclerosis and no insurance covers it. And so it's an out-of-pocket test and it's 100 to $150, some places $200. So how are you going to offer that sort of service to somebody 
100 to 200 dollars out of pocket for a screening test and so they don't get screened they end up having to wait for their mi present to the hospital then perhaps you'll figure out that they have atherosclerosis so it's a really good point mm-hmm. i think you both raise um um uh, important points re- um surrounding diagnosis because you know the we um when we talk about like disparities, we also we often talk about um, differences in the way people are managed or when treatments are accessible. Um, but I think before you can even get to that step, you have to have a diagnosis and a correct diagnosis. And so I think it's really critical at the diagnosis um, uh, stage to make sure that we're able to capture patients' risk and figure out how we can intervene early um, instead of waiting down the line when um, they have serious complications. So Dr. Drew, you're a primary care doctor, and so we've heard this perspective of the specialist. What's the perspective of the primary care doctor? Because you're the one initiating the referrals, and what challenges do you experience um, as the referrer? Well, let's start with the diagnosis first, since we were talking about that. So I'm old enough to remember where there was no hemoglobin A1C. That's the blood test we usually get. And we had to do something called the glucose tolerance test that you know well, which (laughs) requires multiple sticks and coming in fasting. And then it was much harder. Mm -hmm. But now we have a good diagnostic test that is covered. And so I think that's less of a problem. But, you know, Mm -hmm. I think uh, I'm a big advocate of screening. Maybe some people don't. But as you know, the guidelines are anyone who's 35 to 70 now who's overweight or obese should be screened. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. I think, um, you know, a lot of people break down in tears when I diagnose them with this. And we just have a long talk. And I tell people, you know, you may have lived to eat before, but now you have to eat to live. Mm -hmm. And we go over it with the healthy plate method, what they're supposed to eat, what they're supposed to do. And I'll just say, though, that I think it's it's a challenge because people also ask me, well, how long do I have to take this diabetes medicine? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to take it anymore after a year or two years or three years. So it's a challenge when they stop it. Um, and so then in terms of referrals, certainly I, I particularly, Dr. Rosas, you know, definitely screen for microalbumin. And I'll refer if they have advanced CKD, even potentially stage 3B or stage 4, certainly, to a nephrologist, which is when you start to have uh, worsening creatinine and um, uh, 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 higher albumin in the urine. Um, but often, I think the people that we refer, because essentially we have the medications that are not as expensive as the ones that were noted to control blood sugar. So the problem is, I think the people that end up referring with very high A1Cs, for example, are the ones where their social determinants are the most adverse. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason, they're not able to take their medicines, to coordinate, to check their sugar. There's a lot of life chaos and things going on. And so I think those are the people that end up sending a specialist. Um because I think it's just challenging uh, to do. And I know that it's also hard for the specialists, but I think most folks, um, and particularly most folks who are more affluent, are a little bit easier to control, to be honest with you. And it tends to be folks that have these determinants that are not not great that I tend to refer. Mm 